You're watching ABC's Wide World of Sports. A year ago, Kentucky Speedway saw the emergence of IndyCar's Young Guns with breakthrough races from Jacques Lazier and Sam Hornish Jr. Whoa, some tight racing there. there. They there. are wheel-to-wheel, -wheel, side there. by side. You just wonder how long this can continue this way. It was also the first podium finish for then 19-year-old Sarah Fisher. Buddy Lazier won here last year, and this season he's captured two of the last three races. He'll zero in on Hornish's points lead and the rest of the Indy Racing League's best next. of the Belterra Casino Indy 300 from Kentucky Speedway, the ninth race of the 2001 Indy Racing League schedule. 22 drivers ready to race 200 laps on this one and a half mile trioval. And Jackaroot, the field will be led by teammates. And Bob, for the second time in the last three races, this man, Scott Sharp, will bring the field down for this IndyCar event. Scott, do you set a race pace? Do you have something preconceived? Well, Jack, pretty much uh, we don't have a lot to lose. We try to, we got to go try to win this race, remain in the points battle, just go hammer it. Hope, uh, you know, we got to run as far as the strong as, as the car will give me, and that, that's our plan. And, Bob, as you alluded to, this is also the second time this season that teammates are on the front row. Flanked, flanking Scott Sharp is Mark Dismore, his teammate, and Vince Welch, the last time that these two started on the front row was in Texas. And Scott Sharp came home victorious. Well, Jack, another one of the top stories this weekend has been the performance of the Infinity-powered machines. Eddie Cheever will start on the inside of row two today. And, Eddie, the Infinity seems to have run strongest at the mile-and-a-half tracks. Do you feel like you have an advantage at any position today? When we developed and designed this engine, we kept in, in mind the fact that many of the racetracks we race on are mile-and-a-half ovals and Indianapolis 500, so we did the torque curve accordingly to suit those racetracks. I don't know if we have an advantage, but I would say that we're definitely competitive with this engine. But there's just two of us, myself and Buell, and a whole bunch of them. And uh, every time we beat him, it's a lot of fun. Eddie Cheever, he mentioned the other one, and that is Robbie Buell, who will start on the outside of row two. The Infinity, both positions, third and fourth in the second row today, Bob. Thanks very much, Vince. Hi, everyone. I'm Bob Jenkins, and it's been a very interesting weekend so far. Not so much because of what has happened, but rather what has not happened. There were predictions because of a rough racetrack we would have lots of spins and crashes, but Larry Rice, so far, none of that. Well, and that's because the IRL changed some of the rules. They put more rear wing in the cars, and the track here has worked very hard. They work for seven days, 24 hours a day, to apply Rhino Patch. It's not really a patch, but it's a coating that gives a consistent grip all the way around the corners. Everybody's happy with that because it was really not the bumps. It was the grips that was a problem. And with more on that, let's go back down to Jackaroot. And, Bob, with apologies to Emerald Lagasse, let me see if I can tell you how Rhino Patch works. You take a polymer mixture along with this material here, you mix them together, and we can't really tell you what the mixing process in terms of what to what is, but it comes and becomes kind of a, a soupy mixture. But then you can apply it either with a squeegee, a brush, or in the case here of the Kentucky Motor Speedway, it was sprayed on. When it dries, it becomes very elastic. It creates a very even consistency. That's the case through all the corners here. Jason Priestley, we told you what the track has done to solve the problem. What has the IRL done? Well, Jack, I'm here with Brian Barn Barnhard, Vice President of Operations for the Indy Racing League. Now, Brian, you guys modified the rules package coming into this race. You went from a six-degree rear wing to a 12-degree. Everybody's running a one-inch wicker bill. What did the IRL hope to accomplish by making these changes? Well, we had a little bit of an uncertain situation with the work done by the Kentucky Motor Speedway staff on the racetrack, and we just wanted to add about 250 pounds of downforce, a little built-in safety margin, and, and make for a better show for the fans as well. And I think everybody's responded very well. The racetracks worked very hard at it, and our teams have adapted to the situation well. We're ready to go racing. Well, Vince Welsh, the racing promises to be very close and competitive this weekend. 
But there, that's not the only thing that's close to competitive in the IRL right now. That's right, Jason. Sam Hornish Jr. has never trailed this season in the championship standings. He has a 40-point lead over Buddy Lazier currently. But Lazier is charging, having won three of the last four races. There you see the 91 car, Buddy. If Hornish would finish last today and Lazier would win, Buddy could indeed take the points lead. Also, a Lazier victory would make him the first driver with four victories in a single IRL season. And the battle for the championship is just one of the stories we'll keep an eye on this afternoon as the Indy Racing League competes at the Kentucky Speedway in the Kentucky Indy 300. The Kentucky Indy 300 on ABC Sports, brought to you by Oldsmobile and your local Oldsmobile dealers. Pennzoil, protection under the toughest driving conditions. And Delphi Automotive Systems, driving tomorrow's technology. Well, a B1 bomber has made a flyover as we count down to the green flag. The cars are on the track. Let's check the starting lineup for today's race. On the front row, Team Kelly, the fourth time these teammates, Scott Sharp and Mark Dismore, have occupied the front row. Row number two, two Infinity-powered cars, Eddie Cheever Jr. and Robbie Buell. Cheever enjoys rock climbing and surfing in his spare time. He started from the third position four times this year. We congratulate Robbie and Becky Buell on the birth of their new daughter, Quinn. In row number three, it's Greg Ray and Billy Boat coming off his best season finish at Nashville. Row number four, it's Jeff Ward with new sponsorship from John Mellencamp and points leader Sam Hornish Jr. Allenzer Jr. had his best start since Texas last year and Robbie McGee alongside. Starting 11th, defending series and race champion Buddy Lazier and Felipe Giafoni. In the seventh row, it's Jock Lazier coming off his best IRL finish and Eliseo Salazar. 15th, making his IRL debut, Rick Treadway and Brazilian Ayrton Dare. He drives and has fun in anything with two or four wheels. The ninth row consists of Didier Andre and Shigei Hattori. Back in row number 10, it's Buzz Calkins and Sarah Fisher, who led her first IRL race here last year. Row number 11, Billy Rowe and Donnie Beachler. Beachler had trouble qualifying and will start at the tail of the field. We'll have radio contact with Robbie Buell as the race progresses this afternoon. Robbie, this is Larry Rice. Is there any special strategy given the conditions of the racetrack today? Robbie, this is Larry Rice. Is there any special con strategy today given the conditions of the racetrack? A lot of static or feedback from somebody I don't understand. Try one more time, Robbie. <laughs> Can you, uh, is there any special strategy at the start of this race? Talking to me right now, doesn't need to do that. Okay. We are getting close to the green flag. Well, let's check the stories that will follow during the race. Of course, we'll keep a track, uh, watch on the track surface. The points championship and the battle up front, Kelly Power and Infinity Power. It's a beautiful day in northern Kentucky with a temperature 88 degrees, relatively low humidity. There were showers in the area last night. They are gone. Quickly, before the green, let's check in with Jack Aroot. Bob, you want a long shot. Take a look. Starting in ninth position, it is Al Unser, Jr. Normally, he would short pit to try and work his way to the front. They say no problem this time. They'll stay in sequence and go to the front on their own, Vince. Making his very first start today is Rick Treadway, the son of this man, a team owner, Fred Treadway. Ricky making his first start, but he's had plenty of tests. Testing laps, 2,000 miles of testing. They just want to keep it clean and be running at the finish today, Bob. Beautiful day as the cars light up behind the pace car. Now the car pulls into the pit lane. And the 22 starters are ready to go in the Kentucky Indy 300. The driver on the move is in that yellow car. That's Sam Hornish Jr. as he's already picked up a couple of spots. He got a fantastic start on the green. And this Pennzoil Panther team has a habit of not having the greatest car during qualifying, but they find speed in that car between qualifying and race day. Looks like they may have done the same thing this weekend. This is the first race that Scott Sharp has led since he won the Texas Racing Junior. Kelly Boat got a great start as well outside of row three. He's up to four spot. Got around Eddie Cheever there on that start. Now that's Cheever didn't look like he got a very good start. Uh, there were a couple of cars all over the back of him going into turn one. He might have been in the wrong gear. And Jeff Ward just passed Hornish. Now Ward will be in a totally different looking car today. He does have that sponsorship from John Mellencamp. The car is red and blue and a little bit of white. 
He moves up to sixth position. Sam Hornish Jr. is in seventh. Up front, it is Scott Sharp. And again, the way you can tell these Kelly cars apart, Scott Sharp has the yellow rear wing. Mark Dismore has the black rear wing. And here's Hornish at the start of the race. And look at this. Man, oh, man. I tell you what, that kid is better catching a car like that. These cars don't give you much warning. When it does that, that's a big, big movement inside that race car. And he caught that car. I'm telling you, there's probably 70% of the guys that would not have caught that car. I asked Sam Hornish one time why he could attribute that characteristics you talked about, Larry. He said he thought it was probably from years and years and years of running go-karts. He said go-karts, you may be awfully low to the ground, not going very fast. And he said it's an awfully similar feel to what he gets in one of these ILO cars. I recall that isn't the first time that we've seen Sam in a bit of a bobble at the beginning of a race. Right, he's done that a couple of different times. Uh, Pike's Peak, I think, in Indy, he had a bit of a bobble, too. So, so he's done that several times. That's why it's so amazing because I talked to some of the drivers earlier because usually by the time you feel these things get loose they're already gone and they're already in the fence and they're already spun. I'll tell you what Larry I drove one of the Kelly cars down at down at Homestead and you drive around the track in these cars and it feels like there's an elephant sitting on top of you there's so much downforce and now they've got two this weekend. That, you, no, no kidding with the new rear wing. <laughs> Well, the uh, scoring in the upper left of your screen, whenever you see an arrow up or down, it means that from the last lap, that driver has gained or lost a position. It's Sharp, Dismore, Robbie Buell running in third spot, then Boat, and then Cheever, the top five. And we're on board with Mark Dismore, who is chasing his Kelly teammate, Scott Sharp. And you could really see the different lines you could take around this racetrack. Scott Sharp, say, down low, coming coming down the front straightaway. Mark Dismore gave his car, let it have its head, and move out to the outside wall. Not unexpectedly, Donnie Beachler has made the biggest jump. He did not qualify because of a mechanical problem, but started the rear of the field and has gained six spots. On the other hand, Alan Sir Jr., who started ninth, has lost six positions, and Greg Ray has fallen from fifth to tenth in the first seven laps. That's a bit unusual because usually Unzer races a lot better than he qualifies, so, uh, you know, you might watch that because he, he might pick that thing back up here in a little bit. Bobby Buell is hanging right in there in third position behind Mark Dismore as we look back to Buell. Greg, Greg Ray has already reported uh, radio problems, and he's told them that uh, he's going to have to tell them in their pit stop hand signals as to what he wants done with the race car because they can't hear him. The old-fashioned way, huh? Yeah, the old-fashioned <laughs> way. You know, I was talking to Robbie Buell this weekend, and uh, he's had a really fast car in the last four events. Uh, every, actually, ever since the Indianapolis 500, where he was really quick, he was telling me this weekend, it's, it's been kind of frustrating for them, but they're looking for their luck to turn around. Now, as we're on board with uh, Mark Dismore here, you can actually see where this rhino patch was put down. Watch as he approaches turn number three. Right there is where it begins, and you'll notice they put it three lanes wide, so there'll be lots of room. It ends right there. Yes, and it has made a big difference. Mark Dismore told me this morning that when he got here, the car, race car was all apart. He said, I don't know when my luck is going to change. We had a water leak, so they had to take everything apart. And still, two hours before the race, it wasn't back together. Hopefully, they got everything fixed and right. So far, everything looks great. Larry, what they ended up doing is changing out the water pump, and they felt that that was the culprit and where the leak was coming from. Make no mistake, the track is relatively rough. You will notice on our onboard cameras that the steering wheel bounces around a bit in the driver's hand, but it is much better than it was, and that grip really helps things. And Dismore is trying everything he can to catch sharp, but they tried a little too hard there. Right, he got a little too close. Looking inside, looking inside, inside, inside. Still there, inside, still there. Still there. And that's how competitive these cars are. You make, you make one little mistake, and the guy who's behind you can jump right up inside you, Larry, right? Well, he didn't make a mistake, but he got so close that it took the air off the front wings. When he did that, the front end pushed on him, and he had to lift just a little bit, and that little bit gave Robbie Buell a chance to try to get under him, but uh, he did a great job running the outside three. Buell gave it a shot, but was not able to take over that position, and now we see Billy Boat closing in on Buell as the front four are running very close together on the racetrack board with Sam Hornish, who's still back in the seventh spot. Yeah, I talked to these guys earlier today. They're, they just want to finish races and finish ahead of Buddy Lazier. That's their goal for the rest of the year, because if they do that, they're going to win the championship, and that's got to be on their minds at this late in the season. 
it is the time to start thinking about that Northern Light Cup and the $1 million bonus as Hornish now moves to the inside of Jacques Lazier, who fell two positions at the start of the race, but now has come back to run in seventh position. But uh, Sam Hornish is trying to get around him. There is Scott Sharp, who has about a six-tenths of a second lead on his teammate Mark Dismore. Robbie Buell is third, followed by Billy Boat, Eddie Cheever Jr., and Jeff Ward. 14 of the 200 laps have been completed here at Kentucky Speedway. They just put a lap on Buzz Calkins. Buzz and Sarah Fisher have both lost laps here in the first 23 laps of this event. Jack? And the problem with Sarah Fisher is the car has gone way loose on Sarah. And one thing we've learned with experience with Sarah Fisher, she does not like a very, very, very loose race car. She said it is very bad right now. They're just trying to talk her through it and get her to the first pit stop. Ever since she crashed at Richmond with a loose race car, she's been very, very... Oh, look at this. Billy Boat moves into third place. Wow, Billy so, Boat just drove around Robbie Buell like he was standing still. Well, they've had a very good race car the last few races. We've talked before about how they have made so much progress since they bought this car. They got it, what, two weeks before Phoenix, the first race. And every time they go out, they seem to make progress. And, and he's really been strong, especially the last three races. I talked to Billy Boat earlier in the week. He said the biggest problem they had is it looks as if Sarah Fisher's really beginning to slow down is that with the additional six degrees of wings, they took all of their strategy and their thinking out. So Billy Boat and his crew went back to work, and they continued to work on it, practice after practice. At the end of the last practice session, he said, we're right where we want to be. Well, Sarah had her heart in her back there. When she yeah, slowed up, it's because she got so high, they pushed, pushed her up out of the groove, and she was real lucky to keep that thing out of the fence. Now we're watching Eddie Cheever close in on his infinity power teammate, so to speak, Robbie Buell. That is the fourth and fifth positions. And Vince Welch has a report on Al Unser Jr., who has been losing spots. He's down to 15. And he started ninth, so that's a sixth position loss. And as you noted earlier, that's normally not Al Jr.'s style. He's normally working his way up toward the front, but he has not reported any ill handling with the race car on the radio. In fact, he hasn't said a word, so the team only takes that as good news, and they know Al's veteran enough. They'll just let him work on it for a while before before he starts uh, radioing in what he might want to adjust on the race car at the first stop. Well, he may be getting a little better because he's up challenging Giafoni for the 14th spot. That's Giafoni in the multicolored car. Yeah, he's all over Giafoni. He's obviously not having a problem. I think he's just racing. 
And ahead of Giafoni is Jeff Ward, who again has been losing positions. Now, Allinger Jr. looks to the inside of Giafoni as they travel through turns one and two. But Giafoni, the top rookie candidate in 2001, is holding off the challenge. They're only about five seconds from going a lap down, and we have a crash. Uh, it's Mark Dismore. Slow down, Kurt. All right, slow it down, Abe. Oh, slow it down. The right rear tire is flat. You can see the left front is up in the air. That means the right rear tire is flat, and uh, that's a tough break for Mark Dismore. He's been running very strong. There you can see right yeah. there the tire that's uh, deflated. Not sure whether that happened before or after the spin. But uh, did, he, did he keep it off the wall, guys? Because if he did, that's an amazing bit of driving. Don't know. We'll have to uh, perhaps get a replay of it. Let's look. Well, <laughs> well you can see the tire was flat yeah. when he was spinning. Whoa. That thing was already flat when oh. he had spun. And he did touch it with the right yeah. rear. So that's that's a tough break for him. Let's see if we can see from the end car camera. Running through the corner. Yep, you wow, can see. You know, oh, it yeah. just snapped, guys. It looks yeah. to me like something let go in the engine and put some oil down in front of those rear tires because that thing just came around. I, I think the right I think the right rear went flat on him. And you can see the wheel is bent. See that wheel yep. wobbling? That that's bent from when he hit the wall. And uh you know it's like the tire fence it, fell off and, and cut it this. Yeah. Uh oh. Uh, a fan fell off and cut the tire uh -huh. the same. Uh -huh. So well, they're gonna change the tire, they're gonna let you get right back out. If they can get out and save this lap. All right, let's take a look at it once again and right there. hold it right no. there. Yep, you can there see you the go. piece of the tire right there that came off. That's that's a piece of the tire, or it could be the fin that he ran over. But yeah. whatever it was, the tire he did cut the tire, and the tire is definitely what caused him to spin. And so. Mark Dismore's crew just put him through some very fast action so that he did not go a lap down. Pulled in, changed that tire. What a great job by the Delphi Bryan team under some very he's, unfortunate situations. He's dragging no, something Mark, right here in the back of his car now. Right, right there, you see that? He's, he's dragging something off the back Mark, of his we car. we need you to go slow, though. We need you to go slow. We're not sure about the left front nut. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, it's coming off. His left front tire's coming off right here. The speed or let him go. No, yeah. it, no, you... Yeah, you can see yeah, there's the a problem nut's there. not on. That wheel's going to fall off. Look, you can see it right okay, here. You see that gap right there? Here, Mark. we got to take a better look it's, at it. Look at that. that. That thing's moving back and forth about <laughs> four inches. If yeah, he can... left front tire's starting to come off a little. <laughs> he does it. Yeah, he's going to... All the way down. All the way down. He's going to have to lose a lap. That's a tough break because somebody obviously loosened that left front oh, not oh. knowing that they were not going to change this, the whole thing. This is like watching a Hitchcock mystery. You can see the trouble coming. You're just waiting <laughs> just for it to actually happen. It's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> well, and let's hope it doesn't happen. Let's hope he can make it back to the pit road with uh, with that tire still on there, but he's got a half a lap to go. It reminds me of Buddy Lazier earlier this year. Remember how he came out of the pit stop and came out of yeah. turn two? Yeah. And yeah. On this left front tire, just took a left. Yeah, that's a tough break. I mean, you're not allowed to change anything but the damaged tire. That was the problem. I think somebody on the crew started to go ahead and change all four tires. You're not allowed to do that when the pits are closed. You can only change the one that is damaged. So that's what they did sending him back out, but obviously didn't have the wheel nut all the way on the left side. You're so right, Larry. That's exactly what happened. And in fact, on the radio, they were trying to tell Dismore's crew not to change any of the tires. First and second are in the road. First service goes to Scott Sharp because he gets there first. But now, the Billy Bowen machine is Scott Sharp's tight action going out. But Sharp is off and away. Wow, that was like uh, that was like rush hour on the 405 right there. <laughs> Man, I mean, Scott Sharp was very lucky, didn't he? Oh, and wow, Billy Boat lost a couple positions there. As you can see, that Harnish got a great uh, pit stop. Did you did you guys see when Robbie Buell came out there? He was starting to get pushed out, and he actually put his car sideways to keep it in front of the of, of the other car that was coming up on him to go across the timing line. Good driving. Sam Hornish Jr. of course has the points leader, has the first pit stall down for turn number one. We'll return with more after these messages and a word from our ABC stations. Watching the Indy Racing League on ABC Sports. Less than a lap has been run under green and up front it remains Scott Sharp, but now his challenge comes from Sam Hornish Jr. He had a good pit stop and again because he's pitted at pit out. He uh, got into the second position, and now is right behind Sharp with Buell third, then both fourth, then Buddy Lazier in the fifth position. Allenzer Jr. has moved up to ninth spot, and Ricky Treadway, who was running 17th before the caution, had a good pit stop. His crew got him out in fifth, 
And but unfortunately, look at Treadway, that red car there being passed on the outside. Yeah. And I guess that's just a rookie mistake. Huh? Yeah, he just wasn't ready. Both of those Bedfords laid back a little bit. They got a great start on him. He got a terrible start after his crew gave him such a great pit stop. Took him from 17th to 5th. He's back to 11th, and it's all because he didn't get a very good restart. Well, that was one of the one, the one of the main concerns that they had with uh, Rick Treadway today, because this is his first Indy Racing League event. They were concerned about him in the pits, and they were also concerned about him on the restart. So I guess they got one out of two. He's still hitting 50%. On the other side of that guy, Jacques Lejeune was running up front, had a terrible pit stop, came out of the pits in 17th, and on that restart was in one lap. He'd worked his way up to ninth. He obviously had a very good restart, Bob. Jason, what happened there was the fact Jacques just stalled it coming out of the pits. Simple as that. They had a good stop, but he stalled it. On board with Eddie Cheever Jr., who runs in the sixth position. This is the Kentucky Indy 300 for the Indy Racing League, and we are 39 laps into this event, just coming off our first caution caused when Mark Dismore spun and tapped the wall. Sharp is the leader, followed by Hornish, Buell, Lazier, and Boat. There you see the green race average, and we'll check on the stories now. The surface of the track continues to hold up well. Sam Hornish Jr., the points leader, is second. Lazier is fourth. Mark Dismore, because of that problem, has fallen back and, in fact, is out of the race, apparently, whereas the infinity power of Cheever and Buell are sixth and third. Let's find out about the situation regarding Mark Dismore in just a few moments as we continue to watch these first four up front, and they are running very close together. Buddy Lazier there in the fourth position. Here's Jack now. Well, as you, you supposed, Mark Dismore is out of the race, and Mark, it wasn't the tire that went down that finally put you out. It was a problem in the pit service. Well, no, that's not really true, Jack. What happened was, uh, well, that, no, that was uh, prior to the accident. What happened was, I guess the body work, the tire ramp in front of the right rear tire broke, come loose, I'm really not sure, but it got back into the right rear tire and cut the tire. I actually radioed that I had a, uh, a tire problem before I lost it. I got out of the throttle and lost it in two, and if the wall had been three more feet out, I would have saved it, but um, just a shame. I mean, we had such a dominant car today, and you now we got three left, so we'll go to St. Louis, and we tested really well there. I left there the quickest guy, so maybe I can go back there and be the quickest guy. There's a lot of frustration for this team. Mark Dismore says he's lucky in life, but he's not necessarily lucky in racing. This is the Firestone tire that Mark was talking about, and you can see the damage that is caused when you have a situation. Here's the sidewall just ripped apart, and from the looks of things, out of the grooves, as we take a look at the accident, the grooves from the fender piece that cut into the tire. And again, he slides up and has light contact with the wall. It's Mark's fifth DNF this year. In 10 races, he has only two top 10 finishes. And you can see at the very start of that replay, there was smoke coming off of that right rear tire before it ever started to spin. That piece had rubbed, actually rubbed a hole in that tire before the tire went down and, and spun. Top four continue to run very close together again. It's Sharp, Hornish, Buell, and Lazier. You know, you know, guys, you know, guys, Jacques Lazier, uh, you know, he, he was started 13th. He worked his way up to fifth position before that first caution. He came out of that caution because, of, as Vince told us, he stole the car on the way out. But he has come back up to seventh position since then. He's passed 18 cars in the first 45 laps. He's got the Meyer sponsorship car on that uh, this week. And it's very interesting because, remember, he finished third at Nashville despite the fact that he crashed over in turn number two on the last lap of the race. He wanted a trophy from the team, so the team made him a trophy made out of the junk parts from the race car. <laughs> <laughs> got his trophy. Yeah, that was a tough break for them. They had a great finish, but it, uh, the jubilation didn't last long when they saw that thing all torn up. Recycle, reuse, replenish. Right, Jake? Exactly. <laughs> hey, Bob, you heard Scott Sharp say that one of the things that this team felt they had to do, Meyer back in third in the points race, was to just run flat out. One of the reasons for that attitude is the fact that back in third, they need as many points as possible. Let's not forget that you gain two points if you lead the most laps in the race. Those are the only bonus points paid now in the IRL. They don't award qualifying points anymore. Now we see Robbie Buell come up to challenge Hornish from the second position, and Buddy Lazier is right in the mix any, uh, also. Now, as we go on board with Buddy here, 
we've noticed earlier in some onboard camera shots we've had the roughness of the track, but it isn't nearly as dramatic as it is with Buddy Lazier, and it's this way every race. Why is that? Well, I, I think it's the way he likes his race car set up. I think he runs a stiffer car than almost anybody else out here, and that transfers to the steering wheel with, with all that movement. A lot of guys just can run a car like that. I, I know that Poncho Carter, when he ran, he always ran a car a lot stiffer than anybody else could ever drive him when, when another driver would get in his car. And that appears to be what happened here because when he's going through those bumps, that bumps just transfer to the steering wheel much more than anybody else. And Bob, one of the things you notice there, Larry, is the way he moves his hand. He's not at the 10 and 2 position. Kind of reminds me, Bob Jenkins, of the way Mark Martin used to drive when he put one hand right up at the 12 o'clock position. Didn't they call that an Arkansas handle? <laughs> yeah, you're right, as I recall. Well, ABC is giving you a chance to win a ride in an Indy car and a trip to next year's Indianapolis 500. We'll be revealing the Indy All-Access Sweepstakes Driver of the Day later in the race, so stay tuned. Jake, where does, where does Jack Aroot come up with those things? He has an amazing memory, unlike me, who uh, can't remember what happened yesterday. Oh, wow, there was someone today. got really high coming out of turn four, guys. Looks like looks like I was Robbie McGee. He obviously got up, got up into the gray and up into the marbles and uh, had himself a little moment. He got it gathered up, though. There is Robbie McGee, who is running now in the 13th position for Cahill Racing. Running Pringle sponsorship on that car as we go to Vince Welch. Eddie Cheever's crew chief, Owen Snyder, told me before the race today they were happy that the sun was out. The track temperature was up 25 degrees, and they feel as though their team and their driver adjust to the changing conditions better than any other team. But Cheever's had some problems with the handling of the car today. He was experiencing handling problems prior to his first pit stop. They changed the stagger on the tires, and again, he is reporting a lot of push. So, so far, it hasn't worked out to Team Cheever's uh, liking today. When it, of course, when it gets hotter and the air is less dense, the racetrack gets slicker, and that's one of the things they were actually hoping for. Obviously, they haven't adjusted quite as well as they thought they would. Guys, just an update on Little Al. You know, uh, he commented earlier that he was going backwards through the field. He fell down as far as 15th, but after the last pit stop, he's been getting faster and faster. He's worked his way up to 8th position. Rickles Fredway is making a pit stop on schedule, I'm sure, so that's not good. going to be a disappointment for him you know it's so hard i'm sure larry you did it a few times in your career as i did as well coming into a new series in your first race you're you're, you're always very nervous look, about it look at this battle back Whoa, here oh a lot of traffic as they stack up behind buzz Hawkins and fuel goes to the outside of hornish now with a battle for second position but hey they were three wide here at the uh, start finish line well fuel had actually gotten around hornish now hornish has gotten back around him and they both and got a run uh, Hornish tries for the lead as he goes to the high side of the racetrack, trying to get around Scott Sharp, who's led all the way so far, but nope, Scott holds him off. Well, we've seen every time they run the 12-degree rear wing, it gives a bigger hole in the air, so you get a lot better chance to grab. He had to lift right there. I, I don't know. Maybe he won't get blown away. Oh. Man, the Whoa! Did you see Buell down to the inside? Hornish? Buell takes second. Hornish. of 200 laps completed here in the Kentucky Indy 300 for the Indy Racing League. Scott Sharp, Robbie Buell, Buddy Lazier, Sam Hornish Jr., and Billy Boat are the top five. Back with more in just a moment. Back at the Kentucky Speedway, and a battle here as Buddy Lazier goes to the inside of Robbie Buell, and Buddy Lazier takes second. Now Sam Hornish Jr. comes up and challenges Buell for the third spot. Scott Sharp continues to lead. They're lapping traffic. Robbie McGee has just gone a lap down. Last year, Donnie Beachler was driving for the Cahill team for whom uh, Robbie McGee drives, and he had an excellent run here at Kentucky, starting eighth and finishing tenth, involved in a late race crash. But Robbie McGee and the car not 
particularly successful here this weekend as he is a lap down in 16th. And the next to go a lap down will be Greg Ray. Yes, and Beechler, speaking of him, he's come all the way tonight from last place. So he's passed a lot of cars here in the early going. I had a feeling, Don, he would uh, work his way up through the field. You know, he had a really unfortunate incident yesterday in qualifying where he broke uh, one of his cams broke just as he was crossing the start-finish line and taking the green flag for his two qualifying laps. Really unfortunate break, but uh, he was confident coming into the race today. Let's get an update on the situation involving Greg Ray from Vince Welch. It's been a very difficult season on this team and our crew. They released their engineer, Daryl Soppy, prior to this race, but it has not gotten better today. The car's not handling well. The radio has malfunctioned. Greg Ray cannot hear his crew from the pit area. And also, they lost power. They had a power outage here in the pits today. And you'll see here that they're, they're running off a generator in the pit area here in the Greg Ray box. Boy. We've got some great stuff going on out there. Oh. Buddy Lazier coming up on Scott Sharp battling for the lead. Oh. Now here comes inside, Buell. Inside. Buell takes second from Lazier. Wow. Well, he's been from sixth gear back to 50th ship. They've told him a couple times to change gears. He likes to fit better. But, boy, he has taken some moves. And now look at Hornish. Hornish has got to run on him, and he's going to take that spot. Well, I'll tell you what happened. You can hear on the radio there, Buddy Lazier say, talk about blocking. <laughs> Something happened there. He looked like he got his nose chopped. He had to roll out of the throttle, and as soon as that happened, those two other cars were able to dive down underneath him until he gets that thing loaded up and back up to speed. Here comes Billy Bunch going to have a shot out of here. Look, Does he got enough room? Yes, he does. Inside, Scotty, inside. Inside. The laughing Billy Rose. Oh, 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 oh. Right up in front of Buell. Buell obviously inside. right on the ball. Inside. Now, Greg Ray does go a lap down. But man, those first four cars. You know, it's amazing, guys, that the way that the leaders bunch up when they get around this lap traffic. I was talking to Scott Sharp this week, and he said, really, there's only one and a half lines around this track. That's why they get so bunched up when they come up on that lap traffic. No one wants to get out too wide and get out into the, into the green part of the track where there's no rubber laid down because they don't know what they're getting into. Well, they're sure making it too wide now because these guys have been all over this race, <laughs> track past each other. They've been three wide down that front straightaway. Now that Dare, a lap car is in front of in front of them, and both of these guys get by him. Oh, man. And here comes Buddy Lazier. He's right behind him. He's catching him. A buddy got back around front. Yeah, of him. This is unbelievable. Buell is hung up in traffic, slower traffic back there. <laughs> and Philly Boat has already gotten around him. Now, Lazier's going to try the outside. Buddy goes to the second lane in an attempt to take second from Sam Hornish, but can't get the job done. We can Back take there. a shot at the title again pretty soon. Here comes Boat and Buell and several others behind this lead trio now. Well, that second group's got Boat, Buell, Cheever, and Lazier all in. They're all running bunched up, too. Look at this. Wow. There's, there's Boat, Buell behind him, and Dari, who has lapped. Here comes Jacques Lazier, who's gotten around Eddie Cheever. It was a matter of getting by slower traffic, and it really bunched them up. There's uh, Ayrton Dare there on the high side of the racetrack. Jacques Lazier is on the heels of the leaders. An incredible run from 17th starting position. Now up front, once again, the top three running right together on the racetrack. Bob, you're looking at, Bob, you're looking at the in-car of Buddy Lazier, and Lee Kunzman just... Oh, 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 oh my! He got out of the throttle big time. Everybody else... We're under Rider caution. We're under caution is the reason oh, oh, oh. everybody slowed and Holy you know. cow, that was scary. Vince, Man. I'm sorry, but, but that was a breathtaking moment. I couldn't have finished anyway, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> my breath away was. Oh, oh, oh. Unbelievable. He saw that. Nobody else oh. did, including me. And obviously, Lazier didn't see it. He almost drove right up the back side of him. Well, the caution comes out because oh, of oh, debris oh. on the front stretch. But boy, oh boy. Hey, Break out the paddles. I think James has had a heart attack. Clear. <laughs> we'll be back with more in a moment. 73 of 200 laps completed. Under yellow for the second time today. This one because of debris on the front stretch. The pits are now open, and we will be seeing those on the lead lap coming in. There are 13 on the lead lap. Pit lane, pit lane. Sharp and Hornish are the first two. Okay, Hornish guys, pitted down toward out. pit out, and Scott Sharp right there in the flashing blue pit box. Five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. Scott Sharp that goes to work first. Sam Hornish has got a little 
further down pit road to go. whether it was Lazier, but they yeah. were really close at the timing line there. It'd be interesting to see if they uh, if they let him sit where they are, if they reshort him. There's Hornish, who is lined up third behind Lazier and Scott Sharp. And we'll do it in uh, yeah. slow motion. Here's the timing line right here, folks. Right there. Actually, it's this one right here. I'm sorry. Well, that's looks like that Hornish maybe. Looks like it was there. Hornish, yeah. They'll probably, probably resort him out. And that's the advantage of having that first pit because you don't have to go very far. You just got to give it a little squirt in order to get uh, get that position. When the caution come out, it created a real thrill. <laughs> this is Scott Sharp, Cornish, and Lazier. You see, Sharp sees it in the middle of the car. Lazier does not see it, and it's a good thing that Hardish was paying attention because if he hadn't moved over, Lazier might have collected it. Watch this right here. Oh man. And that forces Hornish up into the uh, unknown area, and he had a great job saving it. Oh, yeah. Look at Lazier. Oh. 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 Wow. <laughs> and that's at 210 miles an hour. <laughs> Here's Vince Welch. Well, as we were trying to report when that was actually happening live, Lazier had made a couple of pass attempts on the outside. But Lee Koonsman, the team manager for Lazier, says the air is so dirty on that outside groove. Buddy hasn't been able to make it. That's going to be one of the keys today. If there's a car out there that can run strong on the outside groove, he's going to be a tough one to beat. But so far, Lazier hasn't figured that out, although he did get a little creative on that last sequence. And Vince, we may have just heard the most understated comments ever made on a radio to a race car driver. After what we just witnessed, Scott Sharp's spotter came on the radio and said, Scott, you just missed a major accident right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> there are the positions from pit in to pit out. Both lost a couple of spots, and Robbie Buell gained one. One more lap to green. Well, next Sunday, Arena Football's ultimate game is here on ABC. The Nashville Cats will play the winner of the Grand Rapids, Indiana Arena Bowl for Arena Bowl 15. That's coming up next Sunday, live at 3 o'clock Eastern here on ABC. You know, guys, as the race wears on and more rubber gets laid down on this track to help the, to help the, the traction in the corners, you'll see more cars being able to go out to that outside line. We heard Buddy Lazier's crew chief and Buddy saying that it wasn't quite ready to go out there. As the race goes on, that second line will open up and we'll see more wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing. Bob? Get ready. And nope. here we go. Don't forget that Buddy Lazier cracked two ribs in an IROC race not long ago. So he's driving out there and his ribs are very sore. In this condition, this racetrack, the bumps in it don't help any and it doesn't seem to be bothering him though because uh, I'm sure the concentration is taking over more than the pain. Yeah, he's a tough boy, Buddy. Got a great run on that restart. Trying to move to the inside of Hornish. Oh. We'll go outside. Hornish, meanwhile, sets his sights on Sharp to the inside. And there comes Buell up into the thick of things, and Cheever and Boat also. Look at Billy Boat on the outside. He just went around Cheever. We've got the top six running right together on the racetrack. And they're talking about blocking. All those drivers are screaming at their spotters and their crew about the guys in front of them blocking. And you'll see Scott Sharp, he takes a really low defensive line. He's going into one end going. Boat has moved to fourth. Now Lazier tries for second. Underneath Hornish. They move out of the second corner and go down the back stretch. They're still side by side. Cornish has the outside groove figured out all the way through the corner. Looks like it's not quite as fast out there. They were told in the driver's meeting, if you're going to run the low line, run the low line all the way down the straightaway. Don't be moving in and out. And here goes Cheever. Cheever is moving up. He's going to fourth place. He passes both and leaves Buell back there in sixth. We've got first to sixth position, guys, within eight-tenths of a second of each other. <laughs> and Buell passes both. Fifth. Let's 
let's not forget that the rules changed as far as blocking was concerned after after the Texas race. And at Pikes Peak, all the drivers were told there would be no warning at any time if the IRL officials felt that excessive blocking was taking place, they would be black flagged. So there's a lot of blocking chatter going on in the radios right now. Eddie Cheever is flying in that infinity. He just went around Sam Hornish and moved into third. And this is political. I mean, it's very political. If you think the guy's blocking, the more you scream about it, holler about it, tell the <laughs> officials about it, the more likely they are to say, yeah, they must be right. They've all screaming about it. Well, blocking or not, this does create some incredibly exciting racing for the fans that are here in the grandstand and for those of you at home. And that's why I just hope they don't do anything that will ruin the type of racing that we see week in and week out when you come to an IRL race. Bob, I think one of the reasons why your, your worry is not one to be concerned about is the fact that in race control, we have a four-time Indianapolis 500 winner named Al Hunter Sr. Hunter may be a little long in the tooth, but he certainly knows what blocking is and what blocking isn't. And he is the first guy that Brian Barnard goes to whenever there is something questionable. And he's within about 15 feet of us over in the next booth, and he does keep a sharp eye on the racetrack every lap of the event. So it's still sharp out front, who's led all the way so far. He has managed to keep that car out front despite some incredible challenge. Buddy Lazier, then Cheever, Hornish, Buell, Boat, Salazar, Allenser Jr., Shiggy Atori running ninth, and Jacques Lazier has moved up a couple of positions from the bad pit stop into the top ten. Bob, I, Bob, I don't want to say these guys aren't very good listeners, but Brian Barnhart told me before the driver's meeting today that his main message was going to be patience, patience, patience. I don't know if he's seeing much patience out there this afternoon, but it sure has been great racing. Well, at least now they've all stopped to take a breath after right. the last eight or ten laps. They've yep. at least settled down a little bit. Let's see who's fast as we clock them at the line. Well, Cheever, the fastest. Fuel second quick, and then Hornish. We'll see if anybody else can top those speeds. 212.925, the last lap by Eddie Cheever, and it was the fastest. He's running in the third spot. Yeah, that's, well, that's quick. That Infinity 35A is a great power plant. And has the advantage of the draft. I think the guys leading usually are not going to have uh, the best time just because that draft does help you on a racetrack like this. Especially the 12 degree wing and the one inch wicker build that runs today. Punches a big hole in the air. Guys behind you can really get up underneath you. Of course, the, the, the downside of that is it does take the air off your front wing and you lose some of your downforce at the front end of the car. Uh, exactly. Those guys uh, right now, though, they settle down just kind of following each other here, thinking, uh, you know, do I really want to get up there and get <laughs> close and get it up. <laughs> You know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens when they get into the lap traffic again, as, as we've seen all day today. When the leaders catch up to the lap track, if they get, they get bunched up, something fierce. Here are the fastest laps today. Mark Dismore wasn't in the race very long, but he did manage to turn in, what, five of five the top of the ten? ten? Yeah. Wow, that is incredible. You know, he said he had a dominant car when he got out of the car. He won the Lion. Yep. Yeah, he was very fast. He, you know, we talk about luck a lot, but uh, and I talked to him about this at the driver's meeting. You know, any kind of luck at all would be appreciated by him. Yeah, I mean, just, that's for he sure. doesn't have, have great luck. He just likes to have, yeah. you know, some kind of luck that we can finish the race, especially when he's that fast. Well, it's the old saying, is if it wasn't for bad luck, he wouldn't have any luck at all. Yep. Vince Welch, Eddie Cheever's hanging right in there in third. Well, Cheever radioed in and said that last five laps before the yellow, his car, his car finally came in. And they, uh, during that second pit stop, they used the same tire pressure, so that's a good sign. And went back to the sticker tires, added the fuel with just one turn of front wing on both sides. So they really like the car at this point. And if Cheever's in a good car, you know which direction he's going, fellas. We ought to mention, too, Salazar. He's come from 14th up to 7th, so he all of a sudden, after that last pit stop, has picked up some speed and uh, seems to be running up with this first six, who's really been uh, the dominant six so far. As you can see on your scoring board up there in the upper left, we have 13 cars on the lead lap. Didier Andre, Greg Ray, and Ayrton Dare have all fallen a lap down. There are the top ten, though, with almost half the race completed at the Kentucky Speedway back after these messages from our ABC stations. You're watching the Indy Racing League on ABC Sports. Back at the 
Kentucky Speedway near Sparta, and it's the Kentucky Indy 300 for the Indy Racing League. We have just completed the 100th lap. In fact, now, as they come down, they'll complete lap 101, so we are past the halfway point of this 200-lap event. The leader is Scott Sharp. He has led all the way so far, but we've seen some great racing up front. Right now, it's Buddy Lazier chasing him. We're on board with him. We've had two caution flags, one of them for an incident involving Mark Dismore, the other for debris on the racetrack. But again, some incredible racing. The surface, that's not a factor so far. The points championship is continuing to be a good one. Lazier, only 40 be points behind coming into this event, is ahead of Hornish on the racetrack. Dismore is out of the race, but his teammate Sharp is in first, and the Infinities driven by Eddie Cheever Jr. and Robbie Buell continue to be right up there in the thick of things. And the two leaders are coming up to Buzz Hawkins again to put him another lap down. It's going to be interesting to see if one of them can uh, figure out a way around the other one coming into the slower traffic. Buzz Hawkins is in his 50th IRL event. The caution comes out once again. There is another caution for debris on the racetrack. This comes on lap 104. This ought to be interesting because uh, whenever they have a restart, it gives everybody a brand new chance to uh, to get going and uh, make a pass. Scott Sharp has led 39 laps all year going into this race, and so far today he's led 103. So that means he will get those two points, Bob Jenkins, for leading the most laps. Nobody can lead any more. And let's not count out Scott Sharp in this chase for the points championship as well. He likes the odds if he can win a couple of the last few races. Well, I think some of these guys are getting ready to pit under this yellow, so this might be interesting. This Wide World of Sports update brought to you by Speed Pass. Today's way to pay. It's free from mobile. Well, in this update, we're going to uh, bring you up to date on what's happened in this event so far today. It's the 10th race of the IRL season, and the race summary will show you that on lap number three, Sam Hornish Jr. had a bit of a moment, a wobble in the car, but he maintained control. The 29th lap was the bad one for Mark Dismore. A cut tire sent him into the wall, not a hard hit. He came in, but watch the left front. It doesn't see properly, and Mark Dismore is out of competition. On lap number 69, again, Sam Hornish Jr. This was on a restart. Look at him weave inside and outside of traffic as he tries to get the lead from Scott Sharp. A big thrilling moment on the 73rd lap. The caution had come out, and Buddy Lazier was just not aware of it. There was no incident, but it was very close. We're live now as we watch Scott Sharp pit through completing the work and sending him back out there. Here comes Lazier right behind him, but Hornish is going to lead everybody off of pit road this time. Here comes Buell out. That's Sarah Fisher, Billy Boat, and others now exiting pit road. Well, Sam Hornish's crew once again got him out in front of the, the whole group. Now he's going to lead this race. This is the first time anybody else has led this yep. race. That's correct. So yeah, that Pennzoil Panther team sure knows what they're doing. Well, they did a great job right there because uh, the Kelly team has been doing a great job, as, as Lazier's crew has. I mean, they came out almost at exactly the same time. This is, by the way, the Pennzoil Panthers team's 40th IRL race. It's the 10th race that Sam Hornish has been driving for this team. We'll be right back. Back at Kentucky Speedway, and we say goodbye, as far as this race is concerned, to Eddie Cheever Jr. He reported that clutch was slipping, and he brought it in, and they're taking a look at it, and they've told him to get out of the car, so apparently it is going to be all over. It's his seventh DNF did not finish in 10 races this year for Eddie, if indeed it is over for him. Yeah, they reported also that the CV joint on the right rear was out, too, so that's, uh, that's definitely put him out, because when those go out, uh, they usually break, and then the half shaft falls out of the car, or, uh, crashes, or gets out of the wheel, so no sense taking that chance. Down to Vince Welch. A very disappointed Eddie Cheever, who had just recently radioed in that the car had finally, finally come around, but... Uh, a mechanical problem sends Eddie out. What indeed was the problem, finally, Eddie? Uh, I had two things. In the race, it kept cutting out all the time, but that was all right. And then uh, I came in for a change, 
of tires and something went wrong with the clutch and wouldn't disengage completely so I came in for that and then we looked at the back and one of the CV joints is ready to break so it's probably a good luck that it broke that I I came in because the back a half shaft would have broken in five laps the television has shown us it's been some incredible racing out there how has it been from a driver's perspective that's the way it should be just like that I mean it's a it's a hard circuit yes it is and we're back to racing now at Kentucky Hornish Sharp Lazier, Buell, and Unzer. And look at Scott Sharp try to get the lead back to, from Sam Hornish, but he cannot do it. And Lazier will go to second position. Well, this is, as you mentioned, Larry, the first time all race that Scott Sharp has not led. And look at Billy Boat. Billy Boat made a great move there. As everybody battled in front of him, they kind of had to check up a little bit. He had a big run on him and gained a couple of spots. Wow. Boat is up to fourth position. That is Sharp just ahead of him. In back of him is Robbie Buell and Allenzer Jr. now shown in the fifth position. Looks like Buell's getting, looks like Boat's going to get around Sharp here yes. going into three. Wow. Billy Boat has really been on a tear. He's had a good race car all day long. It looks like, though, his car is much better early in the run. As the run goes on, it looks like he gets a little slower. But look at Lazier. <laughs> he goes for the lead. And lot Buddy Lazier lead from Sam Hornish. And remember, both of these guys know how important it is to finish, so they're not, they can't do anything silly. They can't take any real chances, but they're going to race the heck out of each other. You think these guys don't want to win and get, get a lead on each other in the championship? As I mentioned uh, on our pre-race show, Indy Racing today, and on RPM tonight earlier this week, it could boil down to the driver who makes just one mistake in the next four races that determines the championships. The point battle is that close, and these guys have just been so consistent all year that if one of them has a bad race, it could mean the championship for the other. And Bob, one of the things Buddy Lazier has not lost sight of is the fact that should he win one more race this season, he will become the first Indy Racing League driver ever to win four races in a season. Right now, he's won three, same way Kenny Black did the year he won the championship. Wow, look at Scott Sharp <laughs> back there in the back. He moved way down the racetrack in front of Robbie Buell. Those guys really, oh, look at that. Buell gets by. Yeah, yeah. Take the way. Well, that was Salazar out there. Looked like he was heading right for the fish, and he had a big run. Went way wide, so he didn't get into either one of those guys. And that shock was there also, battling up there with Scott Sharp. By the way, Greg Ray and Didier Andre are back on the lead lap because of that uh, series of pit stops. And Donnie Beachler made a late pit stop, stayed out, led a lap. So we have had now four leaders of this event. Scott Sharp, Sam Hornish, Buddy Lazier, and Donnie Beachler. And Lazier is at the point at the moment. And Josh Lazier just got around El Sal Salazar there. Now Salazar is going to take a look back inside him. And these guys... Oh, he got away from him. These guys are really racing each other. This is unbelievable. Everybody came into this racing. Oh, you're going to be a one-lane racetrack. Can't pass anybody. It's a little bumpy. Man, oh, man. These guys aren't worried too much about those bumps right now. Well, and then it rained last night and, wore all the, and washed all the rubber off the track. This was a totally green track this morning when these guys got on it. And they've opened it up. They're going three wide now. It's crazy. Last time we did an at the line, Cheever in the Infinity was the fastest. Now Buell in the Infinity was the fastest that last lap at 212.982. There is Jacques Lazier running in sixth spot. Behind him, Salazar and Hattori now. Shiggy Hattori is eighth. Once again in the top ten, yep. Mr. Consistency. That's right. <laughs> and Scott Sharp, who dominated this race, is now back in fifth. And it just looks like, you know, one of the guys running back there. I mean, it's just unbelievable how equal all these cars in the top eight or nine are. Buddy Lazier did not lead at all in the first five races this year, but he has led in each of the last five races for a total of 358 laps. And he has, as you can see, uh, officially a half-second lead on Hornish. But now look at Billy Boat. Billy's feeling racy all of a sudden again. Well, he certainly is. And he, uh, he's been racy up, you know, the, like we said, the last four or five races. But look at Robbie Buell. Now he's coming up on him on the outside. If you say that in the wrong part of town, you may get some unwanted attention, Jack. Uh, Robbie Buell looking for a way. He's trying to hybrid. That's one thing about these guys. Hornish and Buell, all these guys have tried that hybrid. 
zero. Nobody thought that anybody was going to move out there, but almost all of them have tried it at one time or another here today. This track has really opened up, and obviously the, the rule modification that the IRL made with the bigger wing and giving yeah. these guys more downforce is, is affecting that. But, Larry, as you pointed out early in the race, let's give credit to the people here at Kentucky Speedway who worked very, very hard several days, 24 hours a day, to get this rhino patch down three lanes so that they could race the way they are here this afternoon. I think if I'm the guy selling rhino pants, I'm saying yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's been good. And there is Buell right behind Billy Boat now, third and fourth position. And actually, Brian Barnard told me after I went off the air with you guys in the, in the show open that he's going to take 10 gallons of that rhino patch to every track they go to from now on in case they run into a problem. He's that big of a fan of the material. Bob, what happened to Scott Sharp? What a difference on since that last restart, the performance of Scott Sharp compared to the first half of this race. I asked Tom Kelly, his owner, that same question. He said it was just a bad restart. He said if you miss it, as Larry Rice told us on the restart, you pay the price dearly. Let's go a little further down pit road to Vince. Greg Beck, who uh, runs things for Billy Boat's teams, told me before the race, he said the key for us tonight will be uh, being able to run the car consistently from a full tank to a low fuel tank. And he just told me, Vince, it's been absolutely perfect. We've run the same speeds, whether the tank has been full or whether we've been low, and we haven't touched the car all day. That is a really good sign for the 98 car of Billy Boat, who, uh, as Jason likes to hear, is real racing. <laughs> Back in ninth and 10th position, we have Allenzer Jr. and Donnie Beachler. And Beachler again, given that ride for A.J. Foyt, a good one. He started last, 22nd, and is in the top 10. Yeah, and he's been very consistent. He hasn't been as fast. The leaders have been running in the 211 range. He's been running mostly in the 29, 210 range. So he hasn't been quite as fast as the guys that have been up in the first five. But he has been very quick, and he's managed to hang on to the guys in front of him. And you know, he had to do a lot of work to work up through the field. The cars are also evenly matched on this track. He's put a lot of work in today. And Atlanzer Jr. is also having a good race. He's up to ninth, Jack. And Bobby, it wasn't a very good race to begin with, but Alan Sir Jr., as you suspected, dialed on the car, dialed on the car. The last pit stop, the one previous to this, they really didn't get the fuel, the tire pressures where they wanted them. That really got Al Unser high in the seat. He verbally lambasted the team. But one of the things that I have found out is they are using the Bobby Unser technique today. What is that? Well, it's real simple. No matter where you're running, you just always pit with the leader. I thought you were going to say you just yell at somebody. <laughs> <laughs> now, Unser to the inside of a Tory there. Meanwhile, up front, it's still Hornish trailing Buddy Lazier, but Hornish now begins to close in as they approach slower traffic. Uh -oh. That's Rick Treadway and Sarah Fisher, and one of them is going to go low and one high, and they come out okay. Again. Keep digging, keep digging. Go the outside of the red car. <laughs> That's Poncho Carter you're hearing. He's talking to Sam Hornish. Inside, still inside, still inside. Keep digging, keep digging. Now what are they going to do with Calkins? They're both going to go on the high side. Oh. Inside, inside, clear. <laughs> Wow, that's great opportunistic driving right there. You saw that Hornish had to roll out of it a little bit and took advantage. Beautiful. He had to roll out of it a whole lot. Yeah. Three wide is not possible. <laughs> Two wide is okay. Three wide just isn't going to happen here. But he's, now he's got his momentum back up, so it's going to be much more difficult for Robbie Buell to make the pass because uh, Boat just caught him at exactly the right time. You know, we forget this all the time, just how young a guy Sam Hornish is. And for, for him to have the, the wherewithal and the mental capacity in, in, in the heat of battle like that, to, to put, roll out of the throttle to protect himself in the race car, that's smart thinking from a young driver. Jason, that was one of the early criticisms earlier in the year from uh, Pancho Carter about his uh, student. He said, we've got to try and teach Sam not to overcharge and be too enthusiastic. So I would say, even though maybe he lost the spot, his teacher and professor will probably give him an A 
is that subject today. Well, Jack, as you well know, sometimes you got to give up the battle to win the war. Arnish and Buell running in the third and fourth positions here. 131 laps are completed. We have 13, make that 14 cars on the lead lap. And just a great race so far, being led by Buddy Lazier with both Hornish, Fuel, and Sharp the top five. The Kentucky Indy 300 on ABC Sports, brought to you by Firestone, America's tire since 1900, dedicated to making it right. Rocky Mountain Cold Coors Light, are you ready for a cold one? And Suzuki, maker of innovative motorcycles and all-terrain vehicles. Back at Kentucky Speedway with a lot of other sporting events going on in this area, the track and hope for an attendance maybe at 45,000. They have announced that it exceeded that. There's more than 47,000 people in attendance here this afternoon, and they are seeing a great race. Here's Robbie Buell making a run on Sam Hornish. Car high, still there. That's for third. Still there. And you can hear Hornish clear. get out of the throttle. Clear, clear. He got a little bit of a push yet to get out of the throttle, and boy, all it takes is an instant. You get out just for an instant, you lose two, 300 RPMs. It gives that guy a chance to blow by you. The top five are Buddy Lazier, Boat, Buell, Tarnish, and the pole sitter, Scott Sharp, who led for 105 laps this afternoon. And I don't think Sharp is running all that much worse than he ever has been. It's just been that these cars are all so equal that once he got kind of caught up in that restart and fell to fifth, he just hasn't been able to gain back those spots. And here is Beechler and Jacques Lazier as they battle for seventh position. Beechler down low and Jacques Lazier up high. And Beechler is going to get the spot. And Latore right there behind him, hanging in there. He's on the same lap. He's racing for the same position. Well, that's great racing all over the track this afternoon. Fans are definitely getting their money's worth. Of course, Salazar, who is yep. right in front of him, his teammate, also, uh, you know, those four guys right together all racing for position. of you in the St. Louis area will want to get your ticket Sunday, August the 26th is the next Indy Racing League event. That's at Gateway International Speedway in St. Louis. It's the first visit there by the Indy Racing League. And it will be on ESPN at 3 o'clock Eastern, noon Pacific on Sunday, August the 26th. I just want to take a second to say congratulations to Danny Lasaski. He won the Knoxville Nationals last night, the biggest sprint car race in America, and uh, did a great job beating Mark Kinzer and Joey Saldana. And the USAC Midgets raced here, uh, won on Thursday night, right. uh, and Dave Darlin won. He went to Salem, Indiana last night and won again, and Tracy Hines won the sprint car portion of that double header at the Salem Speedway up in southern Indiana. Okay, Vince Welch with a report on Sam Hornish, who's fallen to fourth. Well, and we've been watching Sam battle Buddy Lazier throughout much of the day, but he's also battling the race car. Kevin Blanche told me just a moment ago they just can't seem to get it right. One time it's tight, the next time it's loose, the next time it's tight again. They just haven't found the right balance on the car, but they still feel Sam's doing a great job running in fourth with a car that's uh, been less than consistent for him today. That was Rick Treadway that he went around, and again, Rick Treadway is making his IRL debut here this weekend. He's the son of Carlos Fred Treadway, and he is running in 18th position. He is 10 laps down, but no one, of course, expected him to have a top 10 performance this week, but he is getting a lot of seat time and getting a lot of experience. And someday, Rick Treadway will be a top 10 contender. And Bob, uh, Fred Treadway, his dad told me today that they told Rick to just go out like it's practice with other cars on the track. Don't try to race with anybody. Just go out and get the feel for what it's like to be out under race conditions with this many other cars out on the racetrack in that type of situation. Bring it home and put it in one, in one piece so they can put it on the trailer and uh, maybe try to get another race or two in before the end of the year. And so far, he's doing that. Belly Boats crew telling him that uh, it's got breathing room, but you can't breathe too much because you'll go back there. So. More on that from Jack Aru. Well, Billy Bird is waiting, waiting patiently. Right now, he needs a caution flag because if he doesn't get it soon at lap 158, Greg Beck and company will have to bring the curb records count on the pit road for what should be his final stop. 
the window should open, Larry Rice, in about a lap or so for all these teams to make their final stop at the Coast Green. And this is when the crews don't dance, they do the ballet. Yeah, everybody's going to have to stop. The window's at about 50. It's been uh, 43 laps since they last pit us, so sometime between the next 7 to 15 laps, they're all going to have to come in if it's not a yellow. It's been 33 races since Billy Boat won an IRL event. That happened to Texas in 1998. But the last two races, he has been outstanding. Finished second in Nashville. He's running second here this afternoon. But he has Robbie Buell right on the rear wing. Robbie Buell's reporting that his car is getting a little looser as time goes on. Uh, they may make a change during the pit stop with a wicker or something, but uh, right now it doesn't look to be too bad as he appears to be catching Billy Boat slightly. And by looser, we mean the back end of the car wants to come around the front end of the car in the corners. Now, I saw Greg Beck uh, during the week this past week, and I was talking to him about the condition of this racetrack and how everybody was a little nervous about the Nashville track being rough. And he says, uh, oh, man, we like those rough racetracks. We'll take those any day. <laughs> Jacques Lazier slows on the racetrack. This does not appear to be a routine pit situation. He's going far, far too slow for that. So Jacques Lazier here on the 151st lap appears to be in trouble. And Sam Smith's team just bought all of Dick Simon's uh, stuff. Dick Simon apparently uh, going to quit racing. So he bought all these cars, all these transporters and everything, gearing up for next year already. And we continue to watch this battle for second position as both and Buell are right together. There's Fornish back there in fourth. Yeah, and Buell is catching both slightly, uh, but both of them are actually losing ground to Buddy Lazier. Robbie, we're approaching our Lazier pit window in five laps. In five laps. Lazier has filled up a interval of about two and a third seconds over the second place boat there on the left of your screen. I love to keep bringing this up, guys. Donnie Pizzo started dead last. Yep. He's now in sixth position. He's yep. having a great run. Very good run. Here is Buddy Lazier moving through the slower traffic. Vince, watch the word on Brother Jacques. Well, he was having a fuel pressure problem. Not out of fuel, but just having a fuel pressure problem, but they're not exactly sure uh, enough to pinpoint the exactness of the situation, but they do know a fuel pressure problem. So keep an eye on the uh, Jacques Lazier machine and see if he can keep it out there up to speed. Yeah, he's moving back out onto the racetrack. You remember that earlier in the season, Jacques and Angelique announced that they were expecting, well, Buddy and Kara are expecting their second child. What the heck's going on in Aspen? <laughs> Hey, they're always, uh, that's just like a big brother to try and steal the little brother's thunder. <laughs> they're always in competition, aren't they? <laughs> well, congratulations to Buddy and Kara. That's great. Buell is going to pit on about another... Oh, there is Salazar. Wow. Looks like he uh, was trying to slow down so he didn't get a penalty. Entering the pits, and when he hit the brakes too hard, just entering the pits... He's fun. Yellow, what? yellow, yellow. Oh, that's gonna... close. Pits are closed. Car 91, your leader. He's on the back stretch. He's on the back. Stretch. This yellow comes at a very opportune time because it's going to allow everybody to come in under caution and make what could be their final pit stop. And I think for some guys, this is a break. For some guys, it's not. For instance, I think for Hornish, this is probably not a good thing because his team is so quick, he might get an mm. advantage under green flag pit stops. Uh, somebody else, like Billy Boat, who looks like he's having trouble getting out of the pits. Uh, not that he's the pit crew is slow, but it looks like once he gets on the throttle out of the pits, he's not gaining speed very quickly. So it might be a huge break for him. Well, and Larry, it was a huge break for uh, Robbie Buell's team. In fact, the, his crew had already gone over the wall to prepare for uh, Robbie's pit stop. And then the yellow came right at the proper time. The only question that the Buell team has is this last set of tires already has some wear on it. And they're somewhat concerned as to whether that's going to be a set good enough to get them to the finish and victory lane. Well, guys, I actually just got a report on why Alessio Salazar spun in the pit road. Apparently, he came up very quickly behind Billy Rowe, who was already on pit road. And Billy Rowe was moving much slower than Salazar. He had to lock him up to avoid hitting Billy. And that's why he spun. Billy Rowe has a brand new sponsor that he's announced today. Juno.com will be carried on that car for Team Zally for the rest of the season. So kudos to Rowe and company. That red flag, of course, indicates that the pits are closed for the moment as the pace car leads the field. Uh, down the uh, trioval area of the racetrack once again. Salazar is still uh, 
in the middle of pit road. That's the reason for the caution. And Greg and, and Greg Beck is just going down to A.J. Foyt to have a conversation with Salazar's crew. You were talking about the difficulties that Billy Boat has been having getting off of pit road. Well, according to Greg, Greg Beck, it has been that Salazar has kept him sandwiched in the way he pits, and with Giafoni directly in front of Billy Boat, there isn't a lot of wiggle room. So Beck is trying to do some advanced planning here and let everybody know that the second place car is going to make a run. There are the cars that uh, are out of the race. Dare, Eddie Cheever, and Mark Dismore. And the stories, well, the points championship continues to be very interesting. Hornish is now fourth, and Lazier is the leader of the race. And the uh, remaining member of Team Kelly continues to do well. That, of course, is Scott Sharp, who's running fifth. And Buell, the remaining member of the Infinity delegation, is also still very much in contention, running in third, as the pits remain closed. And one of the problems with getting in and out of the pits here is these pit boxes are only 36 feet long. That's the smallest pit box we've had for the last several races, and it does present some problems getting in and out. And the Greg Beck team, Larry, is very upset. The Curb Records team has gone to the Foyt team, asked for some courtesy. They have not been given it. The right front tire changer refuses to budge, despite the fact that Salazar is being hand-pushed onto pit road. So the Curb Records team is very upset. They wanted to have a clear run in, and now they're going to have to squeeze in and squeeze out. Well, this is going to be interesting to see when they do open the pits because this could win or lose the race for you. First guy in, first guy, or not first guy in, but first guy out is going to have a huge advantage because, uh, and we've seen that Sam Hornish and that Pan Pinsel Panther crew have got some great pit stops the last two times in. And now the pits open up, and here we go. This could possibly decide who's going to win this thing if... Uh, if somebody can get out very quickly and maintain the advantage, it could go to the very end. Right, Boy, they're getting three, stacked up up there at the top of the screen, and now Buddy Lazier hits his pit box. Salazar just left, so that gives Billy Boat a better shot at his pits, as we see right there in the red. Boy, and this is what crews live for. They absolutely live for the opportunity to give their driver a better position going out of the pits than they had coming in. These guys are going to be fired up. 13.8 seconds. Sharpie got out second. How about that? Well, that's a great job by both of those guys. We talked about the Pinswell Panzer crew, but look at the other guys that did a terrific job right there. All of them uh, got a good job. Down to Vince. Well, we've got a problem in the Robbie Buell pit. When Buell pulled out, the fuel tank went with him. Oh. The fuel nozzle connection just completely unraveled. And you can see he broke it right there. Whoop, that one went way too quick. But right here, here's the fueling man right here. Watch what happens when fuel pulls out. They didn't have it disconnected. He pulled the fuel tank and everything. We saw Lloyd Ruby do this many years ago. He tried, oh, oh, he's got a piece of it still stuck yeah. in his car. Look, yeah, right there, the piece is still stuck on the car. He's going to have to come in and take that out. But look at the fuel. Very dangerous situation as it was going all over the pit area. And, Larry, even more dangerous is the fact that the fuel tank itself tumbled over the top. And there you see them now. And the Kelly team is down there giving some assistance in getting the fuel tank back, uh, back on its leg. So a very, very serious uh, situation, thankfully, averted. And uh, it's not going to bode well for Robbie Buell, likely, in the finish of this race, perhaps. But... Uh, certainly, that, that could have been a lot more serious situation than it turned out to be. You can see how that hose unraveled. That's all pieces of the hose yep. that just unraveled there as he went out, and finally it broke in two, but uh, that, that spiral hose just completely came apart as he took off before they had disengaged that fuel nozzle from the car. And Larry, you really can't, and you can't blame, you can't blame uh, Robbie Buell for that, Larry, because as we watched the replay, it was the right front tire changer that was waving him away. You just do what you told them, Pit Road. So they clean up down there in the Robbie Buell pit. Let's take a look at it in real time and uh, get the impact of this situation. Watch this guy right here. The 
that guy is exactly on right. Yep. He motioned him out sure before. Did. He was watching the tire changers because usually you disengage the fuel. You get the fuel in quicker than the tires are changed. In this case, it didn't happen. All right. Well, we're still under caution. 161 laps completed. More of the Kentucky Indy 300 after this. And a word from our ABC stations. You're watching the Indy Racing League on ABC Sports. In the pit stops, Buddy Lazier stayed in the lead. Scott Sharp gained three spots. Billy Boat lost one. Al Unzer Jr. from ninth to fourth, and Sam Hornish Jr. lost a position. So it's now Lazier, Sharp, Boat, Unzer, Hornish, Buell, Giafoni, Beechler, Hattori, and Ward. Those are the top ten. And those cars are on the lead lap. This is going to be a very, very critical restart. The guy who gets a good start here. 36 laps remaining. This is basically a sprint to the finish, guys. And all three of those front guys got terrific starts. Yep. Nobody made a mistake. That's going to be a very key moment. They, they, they didn't make that mistake. And I thought Scott Sharp might have been, might uh, have gotten a better one than Lazier, but that is not the case. Buddy hangs on to the lead. Now, Sharp has his rearview mirrors full of a Billy Boat. Usually, Billy Boat gets is very fast right after his start. We'll see if that's the case this time. More on the Robbie Buell story for Vince Welch. John O'Gary, you were on the right front there. Tell us what happened. Did you send him out a little too soon, or did, could you just not get the uh, fuel unplugged? Uh, just a little too antsy, trying to gain some track position for him. And uh, you know, he's got a car that can win this thing. It's just a shame. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we still finish decent. Uh, we've seen the fuel hose just completely unravel. What do you have to do to be able to uh, repair it? We'll have to, get, we'll have to get a spare out. We should be OK. Nobody got hurt, so you know, it's just a, a stupid mistake on my part. Fortunately, no more stops going to be necessary for this guy, for this team. At least it hopes not. And a great three-car battle here. Alizer Jr., Sam Hornish, and Buell trying to decide who runs fourth, fifth, and sixth. Whoa, oh. Buell to the inside. Takes the spot from Hornish. That's what you call poking her down in there, boys. He did a simple <laughs> lift. Donnie Beachler now coming up on Hornish as Beachler runs seventh. Well, Hornish had to get out of the throttle a little bit. It's going to take him a little while to gain that momentum back. But meanwhile, they've kind of separated themselves. The fuel seems to be very fast. That uh, little incident of the tip did not bother him one bit. Now, things like that tend to fire you up when you're in the car. You, you get a little upset at, uh, at things and uh, you start driving real hard. Hornish came really high, close to the wall, coming out of turn four, guys. Junior has been very impressive, Vince Welch, in this race. He's gotten it back up to, uh, to fourth place, but his car doesn't handle very well on the restart. But once his tire temperatures get up, the car handles a lot better. So don't look for Al Jr. to do well immediately after the yellows, but once they get into the run, about 10 laps or so, then the car handles much better, and he should be uh, maybe making a closer uh, run to the front. Robbie Buell is on the move. Yes, he has just gotten into fourth place, and he is all over the back of Billy Boat. He looks to be the fastest car on the racetrack. Well, he is by almost two miles an hour on that last lap. He's had a great car all day long. He really does have a car that's capable of winning this race. And I think, Jason, you're right. I think he's probably just fired up. You know, he knows he just averted a disaster, <laughs> and he knows he's got a fast race car. Right now, with Buddy Lazier leading and Sam Hornish running back here in sixth position as Buell goes inside the boat. He gets that position. Robbie Buell now is at in third position. We'll see who's the fastest car in the race point. The point championship is at 18 right now with Hornish leading over Buddy Lazier. And now Allenser Jr. and Billy Boat get into it the fourth. There goes Junior. Yeah, all of a sudden he's going to come to life. Maybe those tires are getting warmed up to his liking. And uh, Billy Boat, he might, you know, sometimes you put on a set of tires you think is your best set of tires, and it just doesn't work out that way. That might be the case here. Not that the tires are bad, but you, the stagger, if it can be off just a tenth of an inch, it makes a huge <laughs> difference in the handling of the car. Look at Sam going hard on the outside of the racetrack and pass Boat. 
Now he comes up on Al Unser Jr. By the way, Eliseo Salazar, who created that caution a few laps ago, is back in the race. He's four laps down in 15. And Hornish now goes to the outside of Al Unser Jr. here in the trial. Inside, inside, still there. Still inside, inside, inside. Pit stops twice to win the race. Yep. He did that in Phoenix. Remember when he had to stall the car, came back to win. Well, we're down to 25 laps to go in this Kentucky Indy 300. Buddy Lazier, the four tenths of a second lead on Scott Sharp, followed by Buell, and then this battle for four, fifth, and sixth involving Hornish, Allen, Sir Jr and Billy Boat, who has dropped back from the group a little bit. You guys are not quite sure why Billy's dropped back. He hasn't radioed in, and nothing on the telemetry shows that they're having any problems. So I think uh, the crew is just as interested as we are as to maybe why Billy's lost a couple of positions. Well, Vince, maybe one of the things that struck, struck Billy Boat is the same thing that previously struck Scott Sharp. I talked to Jeff Britton. He said the last set of Firestones just didn't match up properly, as Larry Rice told us. Sometimes you don't get the right set. I asked him, what about this set? He said, they're great. We're going after the lead. And a driver we haven't talked about a great deal this afternoon, but one who has had a great race is Shiggy Atori and Felipe Giafoni, who's running in a spot right now. The driver who undoubtedly will win the Rookie of the Year honors this year. He has eight top ten finishes in nine races this year. And for second position, it's Buell and Sharp. than uh, Sharp and almost a mile an hour faster than Buddy Lazier. But if he's going to go around Buddy Lazier, he's going to have to go around the outside because Lazier is not going to get him the bottom of the racetrack. <laughs> and remember, guys, we reported earlier that the uh, Robbie Buell team was concerned about that last set of tires. Evidently, those concerns uh, are not coming to fruition, at least with the like 20. 21 laps remaining. You know what I said about not giving them the top? Watch Lazier. He's going to stay right on the bottom. He's looking at that. He doesn't go anywhere near that wall coming off. So if Buell wants to go to the inside, he's going to have a very difficult time doing it. Bob Buell is 1.1 miles an hour a lap faster on that last lap. If he gets around Buddy, he could just check out from everybody. He is closing in quickly. Here we see Buell coming within about three car lengths and closing in quickly. He's got a good run on Lazier, but again, he's going to have to go around the outside. Well, he can't. He's been testing the outside. He's been running in that second lane the last two laps because he wants to know if he can run up there and run fast enough to get around. He knows Lazier is not going to give him anything. See there? Again, he's up there. He doesn't have to be. He's three car lengths back. He just wants to know if he can run faster. Up there. And he is. Robbie Buell's last win came at Orlando a year ago in February of 2000. He's stalking Buddy Lazier as they come down to complete the 182nd lap. 18 to go. And again, we see Buell try the high side of Buddy. Well, the team, all clear behind, all clear. The team's telling him just keep working on him. Well, if you don't think he's trying to do that, you're not watching very close because he is really all over. He's, he's doing what he's going to have to do. He's trying that outside line. He's trying to make it work. So what will happen is sometimes you go out there enough to kind of fake the guy and all of a sudden you dart in under him. You might pull that off too. Ben? Well, the situation with Bobby Buell and the fuel, they're not sure how much fuel actually got into the car because so much spilled as you see Buell trying to challenge Buddy Lazier. So they're not 100% sure that Buell has enough fuel to get to the finish. But they're not going to stop. You can be sure of that. Bobby Buell is trying to get G-Force his first IRL win since the Indianapolis 500 in the year 2000. 15 races and 15 months ago. Buell now may have Buddy Lazier as they head for the end of the back stretch. They're side by side all the way through turns three and four. It's not going to be that easy. Buddy Lazier, we've seen him do this lap after lap. He doesn't give up. He doesn't lift off the throttle.
unbelievable. The fans are standing, cheering, and loving the action here in Kentucky. What about ours? We're standing too. What the heck? <laughs> Look at this. We've seen Lazier do this. He protects the bottom of the racetrack when he's not quite as fast. He makes the guy go around the outside. Robbie Buell is definitely faster, and he gets a good run on him, but he just can't quite get the momentum all the way through the corner to pull off the pass. That's not a good sign. Zero on fuel. They're probably counting to switch the mixture, but uh, he's going to have to lean it out. They're afraid he's not going to make it to the end. Meanwhile, Scott Sharp is just sitting back there in third position, watching and waiting for something to happen. And he's in the catbird seat. He could, when these guys are battling each other, sneak out under. We saw Greg Ray do that a few races ago, where he went by both guys on the inside. And guess what? They're coming up on Buzz Calkins again. And as I recall, Buzz, because he's not up to race speed, has created several situations in which we've seen some good wheel-to-wheel -wheel battling among those who are faster. And now Buell making it to the inside of Lazier. Well, you talked about how Buddy wasn't going to give it up. Lazier does give up the inside, and Buell takes the lead. I think Buddy was looking at that last traffic, thinking, I'm going to have to go around him on the outside. And when he did, he gave that opening up just for one corner, and that's all it took. And that's the first race that Buddy or Bobby Buell has led all year. time he led was in Texas, the last race of last year. We stopped him, he stopped him, he ran the outside, he ran the outside, he ran the outside, and the minute Buddy Lazier opened that bottom of the racetrack up, he just took advantage of it, shot down there, and run right on past him. But look, he's still running in that second groove out there. He thinks he might be running faster out there, the car's handling better. But the question is, does Buell have the adequate fuel to take him nine and a half more laps to the checkered flag? bet that Buddy was here that much care. He's going to try to get him while he's on the racetrack, but right now that's going to be very difficult to do. Reading, reading the telemetry down here, the team is confident that Buell does indeed have enough fuel to make it to the end, guys. Robbie's two wins came at New Hampshire in 97 and Orlando in February of last year, 2000. And that race, he took the lead with two laps to go. At New Hampshire, he took the lead with three laps to go, and I think he took the lead with 11 laps to go. Well, traffic is going to be very important. If they have to lift just slightly, oh, right there, he went all the way They're three wide, and who's got to come out with the lead? Buddy Lazier. Lazier retakes the lead with a little more than seven laps to go. Lap traffic has played such a huge part in this race today, and how these drivers choose to go around it, here we saw it once again with eight laps to go. Absolutely a great move by Lazier. I know right now Robbie Buell is so mad at himself, but but he had no choice. When you come up on a car like that, you can't run over. you got to know which way they're going and where to go. It's Carlo. Look at this.
Bobby Buell had one chance. He got around him. Now that he's just praying for that second opportunity, but boy. Here they come up on red, guys. Two laps to go. Three miles. Here we go, Robbie. Use that pick up ahead. That's Greg Ray. They're laughing, and they get around him easily. So they caught him in a good spot on the racetrack. Both of them went around the outside. your driver. I'll tell you what, this Tybo boat course light just don't give up. They just keep going and going and going. We got four out of five. We're gaining on that yellow car. The first team to ever win four races in one season. And uh, as you mentioned, you're gaining on Sam Hornish in the championship points. Yep, and we're not giving up here. We want that championship again so bad. And uh, the guys are just working hard. We're testing a lot. And we're just doing everything we can to, to win this championship. So uh, I'm real proud of this Tybo Ty boat Coors light team. It's, just doing a fantastic job. Buddy is just so focused. And uh, I think this last 10 laps shows how well and how much he wants it. He just stayed right out there and just charged after, never gave up an inch. And uh, I'm real proud of the guys. You've been around racing a long time. Have you ever seen one that goes after it the way Buddy Lazier does? He's so relentless, lap after lap. Well, he's got another baby on the way, so he needs some money. So, uh, you know, those kids cost a lot of money. So I'm sure that uh, this will come in handy. So at uh, the end of the year, that million dollar check, everybody enjoys that. So uh, Buddy Lazier and his team at Hillegard Racing really pleased today, guys. Well, he uh, has now won four out of the last five races. He reduces the deficit in the championship to 25 points. Robbie Buell, as you can see, ended up ninth. We'll be right back. Buddy Lazier makes it two years in a row. Now, the last time that he won here at Kentucky, he went on to win his first ever Indy Racing League Championship. Lazier victorious today and getting the rest of his helmet off and uh, a joyous Buddy Lazier who narrows the margin, as we said, in the chase to defend his points title. But, Buddy, congratulations. Now, at Pikes Peak when you won, you said the money was going to be used to send Flynn to college. You got another one on the way, so I guess college is taking care of for that one, too. Good point. We're going for I mean, I, I, what can I say? What a great uh, team effort. Robbie Buell made it hard on me. We were running hard, and uh, I couldn't make it easy on him. And it was just a great race, a hard-fought battle. I want to dedicate this win to my grandma, Max. She's, uh, she's back in Minnesota dying of uh, leukemia, but she's a tough woman. She's putting up the fight. Hi, Grandma Max. And uh, I, I don't know what to tell you. Just a beautiful day. We've got now four victories this year. What a, what a great team I got. Buddy, I want to take you back on the monitor here to a very, very close call early in the race between you, Scott Sharp, and Sam Hornish. Tell us what's going through your mind here when this happened. Well, it, it scared the heck out of me because I didn't know there was a yellow. And so I was full bore, and I thought maybe uh, somebody had slipped up and I was going for it. Luckily, there was just enough of a, a room for me to slip through there. So a very close call, scared the heck out of me. It was a yellow, and uh, I didn't know it was yellow. I was still wide open. How hard on the pedal did you get? 
Hard as it go. <laughs> Let's talk for a moment. How important this points title in defending it for Buddy Lazier is. I know a lot of people felt that maybe you guys were a little weak early in the season, but you predicted at Pikes Peak that you were going to be tough. Can you beat Sam Hornish this year? How about it? I, I could never predict it. He's, uh, that Pennzoil team's a great race team, and he's a great race driver. Uh, and they're tough. They're, they've, been, uh, they've had a brilliant uh, first half of the season, and, and we're on our way to having a brilliant second half. So I, I think it's going to be tight. It's going to be a close points battle. Don't forget, last time you won here you gained 15 points today but the last time you won here you went on to win the title at texas yeah well hey two in a row at this racetrack i've never done that before anywhere you know back to back in uh, wins in a year so i like kentucky i like this place it's his old kentucky home vince well scott sharp had a rear view mirror full of buddy lazier a couple of times today that was some incredible racing scott it was hats off to those guys you know they've had a great year uh, four out of five wins for them now i mean they're coming strong I gotta say thanks to my Delphi guys, you know, uh, they gave me some great stops, kept us in it. We had an untouchable car the first half and not exactly sure what happened in the second half. You know, I could run two 13s on my own with ease uh, on the first half of the race and in a draft towards the end, I couldn't even run a 212. So uh, I think we had a little bit of shock problems or something over the bumps. Car got a lot more rough and I just got a, a lot of times I handed it off to the man upstairs today. It was on the edge. That was the hardest hour race I've ever driven. I mean, 100% from lap one. You started on the pole and you brought it home second, and I know you're still keeping an eye on the championship as well because you gained some points uh, on Sam Hornish also today. Well, you know, you can't even let the points worry you. You just got to go hammer down. That's what we did every lap, flat out, and get the best finishes you can, let the points sort themselves out. Now, Brian Barnhart told me before the driver's meeting today he was going to stress patience, patience, patience. <laughs> there didn't look to be a whole lot of patience going on out there. Explain what was happening. Uh, Brian does a great job, but I think those patience words are gone the minute the green flag drops. But, you know, you have to here. You lift and guys just drive away from me. You got to hang on to the car. I mean, there's times over the bumps where I didn't want to lift. I'm just trying to hold it down, hanging on to the steering wheel, just because guys will drive away from me if you don't keep the hammer down all the way around. Scott Sharp, second place today, Bob. And 88, by the way, points out of the championship. You know, the Indy Racing League never fails to entertain us. That was, again, one of the uh, better races that we've had this year. And it's tough to pinpoint a key moment of the race. Certainly one of them was when he uh, failed to run into the back of Scott Sharp there when the caution came out. But there was another key moment with about seven laps to go. Well, I think the real key moment was right near the end of the race. When Buell had a faster race car, had gotten around him, he didn't quit digging. He came up every inch of the way trying to make that move back, and he pulled it off because of that lap car. It was a great, great move, and it won him the race. It's his eighth win in his career for Buddy Lazier. And here are the results now. It's Buddy Lazier followed by Scott Sharp, then Hornish, Allenser Jr. with a fourth. Beechler comes back to finish fifth, then Boat, Hattori, Giafoni, Buell, and Ward. And here are the second ten with Didier Andre finishing in 11th position. Sarah Fisher finishes in 19th spot. And Eddie Cheever Jr. and Mark Dismore complete the rundown.